trying to get a goat to do what you want them to do. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Come on, Rosie. Show your beautiful little face for the camera. No. 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 There's a reason goats are associated with the devil. I know that now. I know that. They scream at the top of their lungs as if wild coyotes are just smearing their intestines all over the grass. And no one cares. They scream at the top of their lungs about anything. They refuse nice food. They need things done their way. They're the devils. They're the devil. <laughs> so I guess I should do an update on goat milk. Some of you have been following along with the goat milk stuff going on. It's been going on here with myself and my landmates, Joan and Bodine, um, which is, uh, you know, Joan is used to making soft cheeses and, and chevs and stuff like that um, from, from tending goats for years, milk goats. I'm very new to all of it. And we've just been doing a lot of experimenting with basically what Juliette de Berkeley Levy has always written, what I've always read from her um, about her whole lifetime of keeping uh, a milk goat as a nomad, as a wanderer with her and her two children throughout Europe, particularly around the Mediterranean. Um, and her primitive, the ways that she dealt with milk um, in primitive living situations. So, uh, you know, I could talk about this with enthusiasm, but the truth is that uh, it's a mix of, like, enthusiasm and just, like, fucked up depression, you know? It's like, mm, I think people, you know, people talk to me with things that I'm always learning or figuring out, like, oh, these old ancient skills, and oh, Victoria, it's so amazing that you, you're discovering these things to share and teach with the rest of us. And the honest, depressing truth is that, no, I'm not, you know, it's that, like, no, I am working so hard, you know, often around the clock to piece together. It's Snowhopper. Come on, Snowhopper, I'm making a video about you. Come, come, Snowhopper. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, but the truth is that it's, like, myself and all of us here and with everyone that I'm working on projects with in my life, you know, we're trying to piece together painstakingly, reinvent the wheel, basically, piece together some of the most basic fundamental functions of human life that would have been obvious, you know, two or three generations ago. Uh, absolutely obvious, absolutely a part of the fabric of daily life. Um, and things that also we're very bonded to the land, so that means specific and different place to place. So not easy to just put in a book and say, oh, this is how people did it. Just do it again the way they did it. Clearly it was primitive. So it's, if, it, if it was primitive, then that means it was simple and stupid. Are you being a baby? Snow hopper. There's snow hopper. We're talking about goat milk. <laughs> it's chaos. So, through simple trial and error in the last couple months, uh, it has now become absolutely commonplace in my body, heart, and mind, and with all of us here, that yes, raw goat milk, and I've been told uh, raw sheep milk as well, Raw goat milk just turns into cheese by itself. <laughs> it's really that simple. Uh, you milk the goat, and you can just leave that milk in a jar on the counter and put a cheesecloth on top or a bandana. It's just something to keep out the, uh, the fruit flies and all the gnats and bugs. And it will just turn into cheese. <laughs> Amazing that we had to actually like rediscover that. Um, so my apologies for those who are already living that way. Uh, I'm just now getting up to speed on this basic stuff. So yeah, before we were buying, uh, Joan was buying cultures, uh, ordering online um, to buy cultures to make different cheeses and, and chev culture and rennet and uh, buying lots of uh, 
acid, uh, like lemon juice, to make farmer's cheese style. Um, which, you know, that's like buying a lot of products. It's expensive. Cultures are expensive. And that's buying a lot of non-local products just so that you can turn the milk that came directly from the plants on the land where you are, from the goats where you are, just to turn that into cheese. Um, so, of course, that's ridiculous that that's necessary. Because what would folks have done, you know, a hundred years ago? Uh, what are folks doing in other parts of the world right now who are still wisely living with animals, uh, who know their animals as parts of their families, of their communities, that w where animals are so still so woven into the fabric of daily life that um, they don't have to get over the idiot obstacles that we Americans do. <laughs> are you catching my drift here that I'm a little on edge about this? This isn't going to be a nice and pretty video. All right, so... Uh, when milk clabbers, that means like the solids separate from the whey. And uh, milk clabbers, when you add store-bought rennet and culture into it, uh, it clabbers in the exact same way, pretty much if you just leave raw milk to age on its own, right? So it will sour on its own. It will gradually taste more and more sour until you're like, oh, I don't want to drink it anymore. It's like, it's too sharp. It's going sour. Um, and then it will clabber. And you'll see like all these white solids collect usually on the top of the jar and then this sort of more trans transparent or translucent liquid down below which is the whey and um, when we don't add any culture or rennet to the milk and just just let it clabber on its own whether it's uh, fresh milk right from the goat or usually like we have a whole refrigerator in the shed here just filled with milk because we have three goats in milk all at once now. So it's a lot of milk to keep up with. So, you know, if the milk has been chilled for a day or two or three and then we take it out, we still just have to let it warm up to room temperature. Um, so just let it sit out. And once it's room temperature, uh, it usually takes between a day to two and a half days for the milk to clabber. And the most important thing we've learned is that you really have to keep the milk uncovered. So we have had milk completely spoil and not turn into cheese at all, but just turn foul and funky. And that's when a tight lid is on the milk for too long. So it's a lot like, it's a lot like meat to me. Um, those of you who've learned from me in person or taken any of my classes or stuff to do with meat, you know that my own journey with understanding meat and living with meat naturally and keeping meat um, in natural so-called primitive ways was a long freaking journey. Um, it took me years to kind of break through all of the lies that I had been told growing up in America, growing up in the U.S. here, about meat and meat safety. Um, so, so far to me, milk is very similar. You know, like meat does not like to be in an anaerobic environment. It becomes, it goes foul and it becomes dangerous. And it seems that neither does milk. So if the milk sours for too long, like with a lid on the jar, it will like just get clumpy and sour in a foul way. And it won't ever clabber nicely. Like you won't get this nice separation of like the nice white solids separate from the clear whey. It will just kind of stay murky and goopy and just smell bad and taste bad. So that's the thing. So like, get airflow. Put a cheesecloth over the jar. Um, and uh, as far as I know from reading Juliet specifically, um, clabbering milk this way is effortless, basically, for goats and for sheep. Um, and not doesn't quite work the same way for cows. Cow milk is a bit different. Um, but that... You know, some people would like mix goat milk and cow milk in order to get it to do something similar. Um, but I've also, lately, I've been reaching out to lots of friends and talking about this with everyone I can. I've been hearing stories um, of friends of friends who uh, kept cows uh, in Europe and other places, and their cow milk would age not into, like, a clabber, like I'm talking about, but more into like a yogurt consistency, kefir sort of thing, as it aged on its own. 
So, so far to me, uh, this natural wild clabbering is very similar to small batch wine making with wild yeasts. So, like during times when I'm making lots of wine out of wild grapes, you know, and I'm not adding red yeast or any yeast, and I'm just allowing the wild yeast to do their thing. Uh, there might be a rainstorm coming on in, so I might have to move this video. We'll see. You know, I do a lot of small batches of the wine because everyone's going to turn out a little bit differently because the yeast is a little different in each one. And that is, is definitely how the milk clabbering has gone, where it's like every jar that clabbers, which often we're doing whole gallon jars, but sometimes I'm just doing a quart jar or less than a quart. Um, but every one kind of clabbers slightly differently. After the storm, <laughs> new outfit. Oy, oy, oy. That's the south for you in the summer. It's like, oh, not a cloud in the sky. Finally, we're going to have a fully dry day. I can dry all my clothes out on the line. All my sumac is out on a giant tarp. Sun drying. Instant downpour. <laughs> anyway, so what has been consistent with the raw clabbering is that it makes for us, it has consistently made a much wetter, creamier cheese than either uh, a chev cultured cheese or a farmer's cheese done with lemon juice. Um, those uh, can make a range of textures for us, um, but can definitely make like sort of a fluffier, uh, more crumbly, drier, crumbly. Uh, soft goat cheese, whereas the raw clabbering for us consistently makes a very dense cream. Well, it's, it's not always dense. Like sometimes it has a fluffy texture, but it's very creamy. It's very wet and creamy, which is my favorite in terms of goat cheese. So my favorite of our cheeses are the raw clabbered cheeses. I just like can't get enough of them. So after the milk is clabbered, like where the whites are clearly separated from the whey, and usually the whites are only like the top third or fourth of the liquid. They really condense. Like as they first start to clabber, they'll be, they'll take up more space in the liquid and then they sort of condense, condense, condense. Um, so, you know, once that happens, which is usually after a day or at most two of the milk sitting, uh, strain it all through a cheesecloth uh, and hang it. Uh, and these cheeses are so soft and wet they usually, uh, we're usually hanging them at least a full day, like usually overnight into the next day. So um, it takes them a while to drain and they're soft when they come out. Now the most common thing to happen uh, once the cheese is finished draining, the finished cheese uh, most commonly is a very creamy, tangy cheese. Like it doesn't, it doesn't taste foul, like tangy like it went off. It's like tangy like a sour goat cheese, just right, um, and spreadable. So that's the most common thing we come out with. That's my favorite. Uh, and sometimes on occasion, like the cheese will have a little bit of like a little bit of off flavor, like a little bit of funk or something. Like it's not rotten, it's not bad. I still eat the cheese, I don't get sick, I don't get indigestion or anything, but it has like a little bit of an off taste to it. Um, and sometimes it's like the off taste is like on the edges of the cheese that was hanging rather than in like the center core of the blob of cheese and sometimes vice versa. So I still don't know what the reason for that is. I don't love it when it happens. Uh, we yeah we've had a lot of diversity so we have three different three different goats we're milking right now and they're three different breeds so one's a La Mancha one's a Sanin and one's a Toggenberg so they have differing fat contents and their raw milk tastes very differently the three different goats um, Rosie the La Mancha her milk is very mild and sweet and creamy um, and hers is like the only one we save for drinking milk because it's just so delicious and sweet um, and then Snowhopper, the Sonnen, she she's got a, like a little more goatiness to her milk, like a little bit of a little bit of sharpness, but still drinkable. And then uh, Saren, the Toggenberg, 
has like the sharpest milk. Like her milk almost tastes like grass. It's like very goaty. So we pretty much only make cheese out of sarin's um, and snowhoppers too. Um, so a lot of factors there. Recently, I mean, we've been making a lot of cheese and we've done a lot of this raw clabbering. It's just become totally normal around here now. Um, but recently, just yesterday, the day before, we had one of the gallons of milk clabber upside down. So like all the curds, the white curds, were in the bottom of the jar and the whey was on the top. And we're like, what the heck? Like sometimes it'll clabber like mostly on the top with a little bit of white sediment on the bottom and the whey in the middle. But this was completely flip-flopped and it was fizzy, like it had bubbles in it. We're just like, what makes that happen? That's so weird. So that one's still draining. I don't know how the texture of that one's going to be or what it's going to taste like. But now another gallon just did the exact same thing, clabbered completely upside down. And then there's another gallon jar next to that one right now in the kitchen that's clabbering normally, where all the curds are on the top and the waves on the bottom. So yeah, it's pretty funky. Um, in general, the like the farmer's cheeses are cooked a little bit. So the farmer's cheese that's done, uh, that Joan makes with uh, the lemon juice, you have to heat the milk a little bit, just a little bit. You put it in a pot, you heat it up. I don't know, it's 190, I can't remember. Um, but it heats a little bit before it curdles. And that cheese, uh, it like takes away the goaty tanginess of the flavor. Um, it's just a much more mild tasting cheese. So it's interesting. Um, the flavor changes so much with heat. So with these raw clabberings, they they keep that sharp, goaty, slight sourness that like I just love. Like oh, I like it's hard for me to eat the farmer's cheeses because I just love the raw clabbered stuff so much. We were also Joan was reading just yesterday was doing a little bit more research on this, and it should have been obvious to us, but I didn't think of it that raw clabbered cheeses. Um, the soft cheese stuff is, I guess, kind of like yogurt in that it has a lot of beneficial bacteria in it that can survive in the human gut. So it's actually, it's like eating a fermented food. You know, it's like eating, you know, good kraut or something like that. So I'm just like, oh, yeah, duh. So it has become quite clear to me that um, these simple clabbers are probably one of the main ways that humans have eaten milk and cheese uh, all over the planet. I feel quite certain that this is just an obvious thing um, and it allows you to live primitively with milk, to not have to have refrigeration, to not have to have ice, to not have to have like uh, uh, a chilled dairy, which is wonderful. Um, other side of that is that uh, the more in-depth stuff is, um, you know, I have read for years in books uh, by Julia and seen other places uh, this now growing list of herbs and plants that supposedly clabber milk in order to make cheese. Like this, you know, uh, things like fig leaves and the thistles and nettles and uh, cleavers, I mean, and sorrels, like the list, it's, it's quite long, um, of just these little anecdotes that you find in books and things like that, that like, oh, in the old days people used to just curdle their milk with this herb, um, and a lot of people have, have, uh, gotten in touch with me and written to me and be like, oh yeah, I've heard this, this herb works, this, and I ask, well, have you tried it? You know, how, how does it work? And so far, no one else has actually done it. So, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. Um, it's similar to me as when I started I started my journey in urine dyes, in lichen urine dyes, four years ago. And, um, you know, people were just telling me, oh, in the olden days, people would just piss in buckets and then make dye out of the piss. You just let piss go stale. And I was like, well, that sounds very simple. Indeed, I found it was not simple. Four years later now, four years, I finally, you know, was getting my first grasp on having, really having the tip of the iceberg of understanding urine lichen dyes with just one lichen. 
they're just one species of lichen. Um, so I was truly, truly humbled by how nuanced these land-based art forms are, these land-specific crafts and arts are. And I call them art forms because they are. Oh, cat, cat. Hi. So um, I have been experimenting with this plant stuff for a couple months, and it's been really difficult. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that right off. So, um, but the herb I'm focused on right now is thistle flowerets from the, uh, I think it's bull thistle, I definitely got to double check, but Circeum vulgare, which is a very, very common uh, pinkish purple flowering wild thistle that grows here in rural central Virginia and all up and down the southeast. Very common. Um, so I didn't even realize till this last month that hidden in Juliette de Berrifle Levy's uh, Complete Herbal Handbook for Farm and Stable, that book, uh, which I've read almost the whole goat section of, I didn't realize that within the cow section she had hidden a little section on her methods and recipes for different cheeses. It's like, oh my god! So she has one that uh, was something that she said she learned in Spain. Uh, on some islands in Spain uh, that it sounds like that was the normal way that the people there regularly made a hard cheese from goat or ewe milk and that was to use the flowerets of a wild thistle there in the Cynara genus so a different different genus than the thistle I'm using here and so I highly recommend you read that chapter um, I mean, it's only a couple pages, honestly, it's not much, but so far it's the most informative thing I have found so far on me, on curdling cheeses, affecting the, the quality of the curds with a wild plant, and it's nuanced, and so far we still haven't really had great success with it, um, but I've been using these thistle flowerets and trying to kind of do a similar thing that she was doing and see if it works which is to take basically a spoonful. I use three flowerets, which are tiny. They're each like this big each, and mash them um, in a little bit of warm water. She uses a little bit of warm whey, but a little bit of warm water. Mash them, mash them, mash them. Like just, just a sprinkle of water. Wait five minutes, mash them, mash them, mash them again, and do that three or four times until you get a really dark brown liquid. Then that dark brown liquid, you squeeze into, squeeze and strain into your warm, or room temperature milk. And supposedly that's supposed to make the milk clabber within an hour and allow you to make hard cheese with it. Um, so I did that and the milk did not clabber within an hour. It took the normal amount of time of a raw clabber. Like it took a day or day and a half. And however, the, the curds, even though the bull thistle juice did not speed up the clabbering of the milk. It did change the character of the curds. So the white curds were denser, harder, and drier than our raw clabberings, which is an indicator that like these will be good for making a raw, sorry, these will be good for making a hard cheese. And that's what she wrote about on those islands in Spain, that the people there would clabber the milk that way with the wild thistles and would actually pick enough thistle flowerets and dry them in order to have those flowerets for the entire milking season so they could make cheese with them all year long for the whole milking season, eight or nine months of the year. Uh, that those curds were then pressed into a cheese press uh, and then dried up in the rafters of the homes for about a week. So I did that <laughs> with like uh, a tiny amount of milk, made like a little hockey puck hard cheese. And oh my god, like just from three teeny weeny weeny little thistle flowerets, their juice, like they had such a strong bad taste that like overpowered the taste of the milk and cheese. And like that taste went all the way through into the young hard cheese. And it was such a terrible taste that like none of us could stomach the cheese. But Juliet did warn that like if you add a little bit too much of the juice of that Cynara thistle, 
it will completely overpower the taste of the milk and ruin your cheese and even maybe give you indigestion. So even though I used pretty much the same amount she recommended, I'm like, okay, well, maybe with this thistle, I'll try using a little bit less, see if I can get a cheese that's palatable. The texture of the cheese was also like chalk. <laughs> so um, I also tried, I tried a, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the wood sorrel a month ago. I think I'm going to try the wood sorrel again, but it's just to say that these land-based art forms, these practices of how to make a lasting, like soft cheese, we've proven, others have proven, it's easy to make. You just let raw milk sour. It's easy to make soft cheese, but to make hard cheeses that are storable so that you can store for a longer amount of time, for months, you know, or years, it's a bit it's a bit more it's more difficult there's more to it so these art forms that clearly have been practiced all over the world they're not simple they're not one two three stick a wild herb in your milk make some cheese um, and I'm gonna tell you I hate it I hate it that this modern culture assumes all these ancient art forms to be so simple and stupid. I hate it because they're not, they're not on the wrong side. Um, so particularly with cheese making, you know, it's like the climate of a place has such an impact. So like the seasonal temperatures, temperature makes such a big difference on how fast milk clavers, things like that, uh, how, how cheeses age, but the humidity as well, and whether it's a salty environment or not, whether it's, you know, um, the airflow, all those things, uh, not to mention the wild plants are different in every region, and the breeds of goat and sheep are different. The plants that those goats are eating, like how the plants that the goat is eating in spring differ from the, all the wild plants that here the goats are eating in summer. So they're cycling through lots of different plants that they're eating throughout the seasons. And how are the plants that they eat affecting the qualities of their milk, which affects how the milk curdles differently, things like that. So these are just incredible variations that would be different place to place all over the world. Uh, and that would not immediately translate from you know those islands in Spain which may have likely had a completely different climate you know than here in like rural central Virginia which is hot we have mildew problems and like airflow is it's, it's hot and airflow is poor and it's a very different it's very different than the Mediterranean um, so you know we have a lot more experiments to do on that uh, I think we've kind of expected or anticipated. Well, probably it would probably take us at least a year here in this place, in this microclimate, with these plants, in this county, um, with these goats, to find some rhythm, you know, of like working with the wild plants here to clabber milk um, without using rennet, without using animal rennet, um, and making hard cheeses that are palatable and edible. Yeah, we expect that would take at least a year. So a lot of dedication and you know, a lot of willingness to, you know, sacrifice, sacrifice milk in the name of it. So it's been a long spiel. Uh, what is clear is I encourage everyone to allow raw clabbering of their own goat or sheep milk. It's wonderful. It's easy. <sighs> yeah, I, I am not pleased. I am not pleased that you know, there was probably a time God, a generation two or three ago when it was so much more common for a family to have a family, a family milk animal uh, to supply beautiful, healthful, fresh milk and cheeses and yogurt and all the things for the family. Um, 
and that is so lost, so lost from our culture. And this is not easy stuff. This is not easy. I mean, I'm spending, we're spending so much work and hours of the day and uh, grazing these goats and moving them and uh, particularly Rosie moving her back from a state of, of, of very poor health um, to now a state where she's very strong. When we got her really a few weeks after getting her, I, I didn't think she was going to live through the night. Her health was so poor, and uh, she had gone through diarrhea, and she had gone through two days of vomiting, and she had so little muscle mass, and it was, it was really bad. Um, so to see her journey back to health has been extremely educating for me. I have learned a lot about goat health. Um, Juliet's books have been incredibly useful um, and uh, it, it's not easy it's not easy but how precious how incredibly precious for all the plants of this place I have a list of all the plants that Rosie eats what Rosie eats um, and there's a lot it's a lot of plants it's a lot of wild herbs I am a believer in all the animals I've ever raised I am a strong believer I think like Juliet was in giving animals, domestic animals, the greatest amount of choice that you can to allow them to choose um, the plants that they want to eat. And given enough choice, most often they will choose the ones that they need and they will choose the medicine that they need at the times that they need it. And I've had incredible stories of that happening. Um, even, I, even in animals I have a story of, of a guinea pig, you know, healing itself with yarrow. So even in animals so small, uh, certainly always treated rabbits that way and now the goats um, but yeah I I am not pleased that in this world there are so many people who who don't have a choice on how to live on the next move to take on how they need to evolve and evolve generation to generation to leave the village to go to the city to make money because they're fucking starving or they've lost everything or they're not landowners which has been one of the greatest problems you know on this earth of people not having the right to live anywhere so there are many people who don't have a choice and there are many people now who don't have a choice or don't have much of a choice um, in options of, of ways to live to survive so for the people who did have a choice, for the people who do have a choice now, and out of the sake of convenience, out of the pursuit of convenience, chose to forsake these simple, seemingly simple, land-based, holy art forms, like how to create healthful, fresh goat cheese from the wild meadows where you live with healthy animals that you can keep healthy and happy. For those that allowed the forsaking of that knowledge, shame on you. I, I feel that way. Shame, shame on them, shame on you. Um, for us to have, for me, and for all those like me who are now having to piece together the most, the crumbs, the littlest crumbs of these epic life ways that were mostly intact, maybe, in different places, a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, depending on where they are. So, um, I can have excitement, you know, I can have joy, I can have satisfaction about and humbleness, good God, humbleness about the things that I'm learning right now with goats, with goat life. Um, but in land-based and nature-based living in all ways, I can have great joy and curiosity and a sense of humor about it. And I also have great anger. And I always have and I always will. And I think my anger grows. Um, my anger also at how much the civilized world, the so-called civilized industrial world now is blind to the, the degree, the, the breadth and depth 
of wisdom and knowledge that has been lost, that is still slipping away. Uh, I have anger at the, the depth of the lack of comprehension and appreciation that this modern industrial world has for the sanctity, for the utmost importance of that wisdom and that knowledge. It's like we forsake remembering how to count one, two, three in order to learn the language, to speak the language of binary, to program a computer, right? We forgot to learn how to hear the beating of an animal's heart pressed against our face. You know, the breath, <laughs> the sweet, funky cud breath of an animal chewing its cud and all the beautiful plants and herbs that are in that cud. We let go of that. For, for convenience culture, right? And remember that convenience culture does not bring happiness, right? It's the sacrificing of convenience, sometimes for rougher, for rougher ways of living that does bring happiness and joy, um, where the convenience itself usually does not, usually does not. Uh, so, Sky is blue once again. I guess I got things to do. Here's my little spiel on milk. Uh, there'll be more to come, more experimenting, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but praises, praises to the magic and the healing wonders of raw, fresh goat milk uh, and raw, fresh goat cheese. Um, praises to the wonders of that. Bye bye, everybody.